And welcome back, everybody, to the Law and Crime Network. I'm your host this afternoon, Rachel Stockman, and we are watching the Larry Whaley trial out of Iowa. And I want to apologize once again, our connection there, the audio has some issues, and we're working at this moment to fix those. In the meantime, uh, you probably want to hear from her anyway. Uh, <laughs> Beth Karras, uh, legal analyst and former prosecutor in the House with me today. Um, okay, so we were starting to delve into a uh, conversation about self-defense because Larry is, Mr. Whaley is clearly going to raise that issue when he wrote a letter to the judge himself. Um, he rose, he, there it is, you see on your screen there, he, he told the judge um, that this was a self-defense case, a stand-your-ground case. Um, what do you make of that defense? Well, you know, but First, how does it work? Well, stand-your-ground allows a person to use deadly force wherever they are, even if they're outside their home. But the castle doctrine is what really applies when you're inside your home. Right. And it allows you to use fatal force and not retreat. You don't have to run out the back door. You don't have to escape. You can basically protect your sovereign territory, your castle. And that's why they call it the castle doctrine. All right. So uh, the, 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 but the issue is whether he was reasonable in perceiving a fatal threat to his life or that of a third person. And jurors will have to assess what a reasonable person would do in his shoes. Now, you say, we, when we broke uh, before, when we were talking, you said he knew that some people, maybe after the woman he was with, he was getting away from some people, and that maybe he heard something, and maybe it was these people outside, and I was analogizing right. it to... Right, he had, he had expressed concerns about him, his home being burglarized by some people he knew from the beginning. So would that so play a factor into, yeah. it? Well, you know what, that's yeah. kind of reasonable then to be fearful if you hear someone jiggling at your door that you might be fearful uh, for your you life know, knowing I, that. I do remember a case years ago in the Midwest where a woman uh, shot her husband in the basement um, and she thought he was a burglar and the lights weren't on and she was aware of a figure and she fired and it was her husband. Of course, some people thought she just wanted to get rid of her husband, but it worked. It was a defense that worked for her, an explanation. So. The, the question for well, for the jury will be though he he, ha he didn't see anyone. It, this is the knowledge in his head. You say he heard a rattling on the door. I mean, it's a factual question. I, well, I don't know. It's not first degree murder. Maybe it's not even second degree murder. Maybe it's a manslaughter. Well, let's take a listen because uh, we have the feedback and one of the officers involved in investigating this is on the stand. So let's see what he has to say. And he's our boss. That that's who initially gets the calls. It's similar to a dispatcher almost for us. Um, once they get that call um, from the, the police officers that are on scene, they get a, a short briefing. Um, our boss who's at home in the middle of the night will um, then give us a call at home and say, um, you need to go in and uh, investigate whatever type of crime it is. Um, typically, he'll place somebody in charge um, and basically assign to the case, and that would be me. Uh, and my responsibilities include basically keeping keeping track of what everybody's doing, um, primarily making sure that somebody's at the crime scene, somebody's with witnesses, and somebody's doing interviews, and and then throughout the case, throughout the next few months, uh, uh, making sure that things are collected properly. So the case was assigned to you then? Yes, sir. And when it was assigned to you, are you initially going through and deciding what resources you have? Uh, yes, I mean, we basically uh, try to get as many men and women in to help us, and then at that, at that point, my boss makes decisions on who goes where, and my, my, my lieutenant uh, wanted me to interview um, a couple of witnesses. So your lieutenant tells you, or I guess tells you is probably the word to, way to put it, that he wants you to interview some witnesses. Before you interview those witnesses, do you, are you able to go to the crime scene and, and look at the scene and get an overall picture of it? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm strictly at the police department um, where the officers had brought in um, uh, one witness, a female witness, um, her name was Deb Ewing, and, and, and then also the suspect, which his name is Larry Whaley. And so you were asked to interview, were you assigned to interview someone first? Yes, uh, I was assigned to interview Deb um, as she was in the outside 
kind of a waiting room area where we have at the police department. So then you went in and did you interview Deb Ewing? Yes, sir. This was all at the Mason City Police Department? Yes, do you sir. have special rooms, or interview rooms that you do this in, or do you, how does that all work? Um, yeah, we have we have three interview rooms at the police department. Um, two are kind of what you see on TV, They're black walls. Uh, there's nothing in them besides a camera on the wall and a, and, a, and a table and a couple chairs, typically what you see on crime movies and things. We also have one that's called a soft interview room. It's got more comfy chairs. It's got a window, and there's um, there's uh, there's toys and magazines and things like that. Um, we typically use a soft interview room um, for when a victim or somebody comes in that we don't really want them to feel pressured that they're in containment or anything. So, and in this case, do you remember which room you would have interviewed Deb Ewing? Yes, yeah, she was in the soft interview room. And you did conduct that interview. Yes, sir. So now, prior going to that inter to doing her interview, you had talked to, you mentioned a couple law enforcement officers? Yes, uh, Officer Barr and Officer Tylen. And after talking to Officer Barr and Tylen, you had a little bit of an idea of what was happening? Yes, sir. So after you interviewed Ms. Ewing, do you go back and talk to additional officers to see if they have obtained new information? Yes, I, I typically try to contact the officers that are on scene. And that's what I did with Ms. after I interviewed Ms. Ewing. And just gave them a brief update on what I had learned during that during that process. That helps the officers that are on scene um, with, with looking for what things that they may not know what happened, and helps them find things. And for example, if there's a a, a specific mark on a wall where they wouldn't notice it, but I was told by by Miss Ewing she could it would be easier for them to find. That's just an example. That's not nothing she said. But. Okay. So what you do is, after you get this information, you share it with officers at the scene? Yes, sir. And may or may not help them at the scene? Correct. At the same time, without getting into what they told you, do officers share information they learn at the scene with you? Yes, sir. And every case is different, obviously, but it, the goal is to get as much information as you can? Correct. And since you're assigned to the case, do you, at this point, start directing people what to do before you finish both interviews? Uh, most of our investigators are trained to know automatically what they need to be doing, um, as long as we just give them a, a general area. I'm briefed right away on where everybody's at. So, for example, if, I, if there's somebody um, outside the house and, and I'm told by a witness that there's a, a piece of evidence laying out in the yard, I'll call. I'll, I'll leave the interview room and call and say, hey, I just got told that there's a piece of evidence maybe in the mailbox or something. This is all examples. And it, it helps us flow to make sure that we don't miss anything. And I don't, and it, time is always of the essence. So if I learn something right away and, 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 it's, and it's very important, I'll step out, brief them on what they need to be looking for. Or if it's not important, something that's not gonna move, say for instance, a, a hole in a wall or something, I'll wait until I'm done. And while you're conducting an interview, at, po at points do you take breaks during an interview? Yes, sir. And some, the purpose of the break, is there multiple reasons? Yeah, two reasons. First of all, uh, this fatigue. Uh, you know, you, after you talk to somebody, if most of you are familiar with, if you've ever been questioned or you talk to your kids, if you sit there and for, for a very long period of time, a lot of times it, you start to go nowhere. So it's good to kind of break that up. Um, it also gives me a chance to kind of, reset and, and go over what I've learned and maybe ask, have some follow-up questions. So some of the breaks, you may contact other law enforcement officers to see if they have additional information that may help you go back into the interview, interview room? Yes, sir. I also offer the person I'm interviewing some beverages or some food, things like that, to keep them comfortable as well. May we approach, Your Honor? Yes. P-R-O-C-H-A-S-K-A. The C is silent. <laughs> the rest of my family takes it out. But <laughs> I got it.
Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we will take our lunch break now. Started just a little bit early. Ask that you come back ready to um, hear the rest of uh, Investigator Prohaska's testimony after lunch. Um, over the lunch hour, please keep the admonition in mind. Um, you have heard more evidence, not heard it all yet. So keep an open mind. Uh, avoid any discussions between yourselves or with other people about this case. And please um, be very careful to avoid any outside sources of information. Um, we want to make sure that when the time does come for you to deliberate, your decision is going to be based only on what you've seen and heard here in the courtroom. Well, with that reminder, I'll ask the courtroom to stand for the jury. We'll see you back at 1 o'clock. And welcome back, everybody, to the Law and Crime Network. I'm your host this afternoon, Rachel Stockman, and we have been watching the Larry Whaley second-degree murder trial out of Iowa. It looks like that the uh, jurors and the judge and the defense attorneys and prosecutors there are going to take about an hour for lunch till about 2 o'clock Eastern time, 1 o'clock their time. I'm joined alongside Beth Karras, and this is a case of a man who's facing a second-degree murder charge for an incident that happened in 2016, end of the year, where he shot through a door, killing um, a young woman, Samantha Teeter. Um, he's claiming this was self-defense, and it looks like from the testimony uh, from the officer on the stand that we just heard from, he interviewed a woman who was in that room that day. So that's, we heard from her yesterday, but that's gonna be at a critical interview to see what he has to say in terms of what happened during that interview. Right, because she's um, an eye and ear witness to the events, but she was sleeping on one of Larry Whaley's couches and she thought she heard like a key in the door and the door opened a few inches. She also admitted that she was under the influence of methamphetamines that night, which may have blurred her perception or affected her memory. So that's a problem. Um, and, you know, Teeter, if Teeter had a key to open the door, it's my understanding she did, that seems to indicate to me that she had permission to enter. She wasn't inside the apartment yet. His home is not, I mean, the hallway is a common area. Other people have a right to be in that common area. He didn't have a right to shoot anyone in the hallway. His apartment's on the second floor. Right, but, I mean, if he heard something and he had fear, it's reasonable to assume then that he could have taken this action. Or you're just not buying his I'm not story buying off. It. I'm not buying it. I'm not, it's yeah. not first degree murder. I'm just not buying it. He fired. He was just too quick with the trigger. I'm not, I, I just I don't see it. I mean, I'm, perhaps I can be convinced otherwise. This would be interesting testimony, what witnesses have to say. But the logistics about the shooting and the injury to her from a medical examiner, that testimony is all not contested, right? In a self-defense case, no one is contesting the incident happened. Right. You're just determining what to call it. Is it a crime or is it was it something that's justified under the circumstances? So we were just hearing again um, from one of the officers, investigators involved, who um, interviewed Deb Ewing, who was in the home, well, in the apartment with Larry Whaley the night when this happened. She took the stand yesterday, as, as uh, Beth and I were speaking about, uh, and she also talked a little about, bit about uh, a, a situation involving one of her ex-boyfriends where she actually booked a, a motel room because she was fearful this guy was stalking her. And um, uh, the, the defendant in this case actually sa she said that he said he didn't want to kill anybody tonight. So I think her setting up that situation also shows perhaps, Beth, that there was a reasonable 
fear that he may have had, right? That that there was this ongoing situation, um, that this guy was stalking his, his, this woman, Deb, and that maybe he was fearful that something would happen. You know, I mean, it's an explanation. I mean, that this is why this case is going to trial. You know, I, I, I don't know what the jury is going to do, but they're going to have to determine how reasonable it was. They're going to have to stand in his shoes uh, with everything he knew under these circumstances and determine whether or not it's reasonable to sh I mean, he shot this woman in the head. I mean, she, she wasn't the bad guy. Right. I mean, was it really just a big mistake? What do you think the chances of him taking the stand? Because again, every time we've, we've had one of these self-defense cases here at the Law and Crime Network, I would say almost 95% of the time, right. you kind of have you to have take to the hear stand. From the per yes. you, you have to. Yeah, you have to hear from the person who's asserting self-defense. What concerns me from a defense point of view is that the judge had to rule on Whaley's competency to stand trial. So there are some um, psychological issues going on here. This is not an insanity defense. An insanity defense deals with your state of mind at the time of the crime. But in the past year, there was reason to actually challenge his competency to understand the charges against him and to assist in his defense. And the judge found he was competent. But the fact that this evaluation was done means that there's something else going on here. And maybe that'll keep him off the stand because he may not do well on cross-examination. Maybe he's going to get twisted up kind of easily. Bit. So well, let's, pu let's put up that letter that he sent the judge again. Um, and this talks about, uh, you can see it there, Beth, on the screen. Um, I have filed several motions. You know, honestly, I'm kind of a court junket, uh, junkie. And, you know, I notice a lot of times that people from jail try to file stuff, try to write, write stuff to judges. I mean, would this even be something the judge would consider? Um, and do you think that could play into whether or not he, his attorneys are going to let him testify? Of course, it is his decision. Well, maybe. But, I mean, it, it yeah. may be this behavior because there was more than one letter. He sent yeah. a series of letters to the judge. I mean, he really should have been communicating with uh, his attorney and right. not, uh, not the judge. Uh, that's, this is probably a manifestation of, of, his, of his mental state. That's that what I was like kind of thinking. Following. It yeah. shows it kind of shows that he might not be totally getting right, what's going on. He might be a little bit of a wild card on yes. the stand. I mean, I suppose you could say in most cases a defendant is, but maybe more so with this guy. Uh, so maybe we won't hear from him, which is too bad if we don't because it's... Can you but, really but have Deborah, a self-defense? Can you really have a self-defense case well, without having him testify, You know, it's, it's, self def it's it depends on yourself or a third person. And Deborah Ewing testified about, you know, how she feared that she was being stalked and described, you know, what... But that doesn't go to him, really. No, it's not his perception. He's, and uh, she was a prosecution witness, too, interestingly enough. Yeah, but she was an eyewitness to this, right? Right. She's, right she was called by this. Cause you know what? You're going to call everybody you can uh, yep. to sort of set the scene. Uh, but she was high at the time, so yeah, you have to take that into consideration and when evaluating what, what she had to say. But, I mean, she did say that she heard a key in the door, right? She yep. thought the door and opened very... Door opening, a key opening the door right. after she woke up. Um, and like you said, you know, the defense was able to make the point that she had a foggy memory, she was high on drugs. It hasn't really come out... One of the things I'm trying to understand about this, and I, I've, I've been looking for the answer here, I don't quite get the relationship between Samantha Teeter and Larry Whaley because clearly she had a key to his apartment, so they knew each other. Um, was What was she doing entering his house in the morning? There was something about she left a bike there at one point. So I, I assume that they're going to fill out the, um, the picture there, uh, for, for the juries, they're probably asking the same questions. I can't answer that. I don't really yeah. know um, why she had her own key to his place. But I'm just having a hard time with the Castle Doctrine, even with everything we know that he feared about stalkers or somebody after Deborah Ewing protecting her, the third person that he had to fire through the door before seeing anyone. I mean, it doesn't sound like the best situation. You got a woman on a couch that's high on meth. You know, perhaps he was on drugs. We don't know at this point. Um, what was she doing th there in the middle of the night? I mean, you know, it's one of these scenarios. 
where it is, it's just not clear. And also it's interesting that the prosecution knock the charge down from first degree yes. to second degree. And second degree is basically under Iowa law, it's anything that, that's not first degree. And first degree is a premeditated killing, a felony murder, and there are a couple other scenarios like during an escape or something. But uh, so that means this is, it's an intentional killing, not premeditated, just an intentional killing. That can be very close to voluntary manslaughter, which is also an intentional killing, but under Iowa law, it's, it's, um, it's sort of the, uh, in the heat of the moment. Okay. And you know, I think you can make an argument that it's, it, it could be a voluntary manslaughter as well. Well, let's, okay, let's, Beth's going to stick around for a little longer. Uh, if you're just joining us here on the Law and Crime Network, we are in a lunch break pause in the Larry Whaley trial that we're following out of Mason City, Iowa, small town in Iowa. Um, and they'll be back, I think, in about 45 minutes to an hour. So in the meantime, if you missed some of the testimony from this morning, we're going to replay Dennis Kern, who is a crime lab analyst, talking about um, some of the process of pulling DNA and what they found around the crime scene. So let's take a listen to that. Explain to the jury how the gun, the revolver, was examined for fingerprints. I used several techniques. Uh, the first was to visually look at the firearm to see if there was something that I could see uh, and photograph without doing any additional additional processing. Nothing was in plain view, so the next thing I did was uh, super glue processing and nothing suitable for identification was developed with the super glue. Uh, the ridges will turn white against the, the black surface or the darker surfaces of the firearm. I used a dye stain uh, on the firearm, a Rotomon 6G dye stain to try to dye the super glue to see if I could pick up additional ridge detail. And I did pick up detail on the cylinder, but it was not suitable. <coughs> it wasn't suitable for identification. Following that, I used reflected ultraviolet imaging, which is where we use shortwave ultraviolet uh, light as a source because it reflects differently than daylight. And what I was trying to do was improve the detail that had already been developed, but it never got to the point that there was enough detail and sufficient with sufficient clarity to be able to identify anything. So no fingerprints suitable for identification were ever developed on the pistol. In the, the photographs, States Exhibit 48 shows the 44 revolver. The actual revolver is in evidence, States Exhibit 5. Through your chemical processing of the super glue and the dye stain, would that change the color in any way to the revolver? Yes, if you see it today, it's going to look uh, pink in color, and that's that's the result of the dye stain. And it, you told us, Mr. Kern, you looked at the revolver, the 44 revolver, for any potential fingerprint. You did not find any suitable for identification. So again, does that mean no one ever touched this revolver? No, sir. Uh, we'll never, there's nothing there that was sufficient to be able to identify anyone. Did you also look at a box of ammunition of 44 Remington Magnum? It was 44 ammunition. It was manufactured by Federal, but it was the 44 Remington round. Uh, that's the caliber of the, of the ammunition. We're going to show a photograph, States Exhibit 46, that it was a already in evidence of that box of ammunition. Are you able to see that, Mr. Kern? Yes, sir. Can you explain to the jurors what part of the box that you examined for potential fingerprints? The outside surface of the box. And did you do the same process that you explained earlier? I used uh, I used a couple different techniques with it. I did the, everything that we talked about, but I also processed it with uh, a very small, uh, small size it's called nano powder. It's an extremely small size powder that is mag magnetically uh, charged, and nothing came up with the nano powder. I used a different formulation of the uh, <coughs> Rotaman. I used one that was based in water, not alcohol. 
and I did that because I didn't want it to soak into the fibers. I wanted it to soak into the glue, not the fibers of the paper of the box. And again, nothing. Uh, I, I saw prints with the uh, ultraviolet imaging, but nothing that I could ever recover, nothing suitable for identification. So this is an example where you see a partial print, but it's not good enough to identify to anybody. You can't do anything with it. The gun, it looks like the box says 50. Were you able to see if any of the rounds were missing? There were 45 rounds in the, uh, the box. The container inside the box is fitted for 50 rounds. Five of them were gone. Did you examine the plastic at all for any potential latent prints? Yes, I did. And were you able to find any? No, I recovered. I saw some detail, but again, it was nothing Talk suitable. about whether or not a fingerprint is suitable for identification. You explained that you need um, a certain amount of um, the print itself and then details about the print. Is that right? That is correct. It's a qualitative, quantitative, how much and how good. That's that's the decision point. You have to have enough to make a decision, and it's got to be good enough to rely on. It sounds like then, with regard to fingerprints, you either have enough and you can, um, or, and you do have a print suitable for identification, or you don't have enough, in which case it's not suitable, correct? That is correct. There's no gray area where you might say, it's partial, and so I'm 70% confident in this. <laughs> We don't offer those types of opinions. Uh, historically, fingerprints have always been, you can either identify it to an individual. Uh, there are times that you can exclude an individual uh, or it's not suitable and it can be anybody because we don't want to leave it as misleading that it could have been this person, but we're really we're really not sure. And that's that's not something that we're interested in leaving anybody with, is that it could have kind of sort of been. You talked about some of your professional organization affiliations and that as the science of fingerprint analysis has evolved, how does it ensure that the individual examiners are working with the same set of standards? Does that make sense? Hmm. Yes, and that is uh, one of the challenges of fingerprints. Part of the way that we do that is through, uh, is through proficiency examinations. Uh, part of it is through uh, various studies that are uh, conducted to see how fingerprint examiners are interpreting evidence Evidence is submitted to a variety of laboratories and examiners have to make uh, qualitative decisions, they have to make identifications, they have to make exclusions, and we're looking at the reliability of that across laboratories. Uh, we're looking at more consistency in training fingerprint examiners and there is variability between examiners. That does exist. Uh, there, there are some that are more acute. Uh, you get better over time. Uh, and then there's a point where you get worse over time. Uh, so, you know, the, as far as do you have, uh, do you have a, 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 an instrument? There's no instrument available to tell you whether you're right or wrong. It's the instrument of your, your eye. It's the instrument of your, uh, your perception. And in the DCI's case, all examinations have to be verified by a second examiner. If you don't have that verification where that person looking at it uh, doesn't concur with the identification or with the exclusion, then we have to have to go through a reconciliation process. I've been at the laboratory for 10 years and we've never had that type of an issue. Uh, but yes, there is variability between examiners. You also 
mentioned that in your experience in doing these analyses, you said the least I've ever identified are seven characteristics. And I'm just not sure that I understand what you meant. If you could explain that. You have to have a cutoff where you believe you have sufficient ridge detail. And in my experience over the last four years, uh, there are areas away from deltas. I'm very careful about a delta in a, because in a triangle, triangular portion of a fingerprint pattern, there's a number of ridges that are trying to get through a very small space. And when they were being formed, uh, formed in the womb and the ridges were, were forming at that point, ridges had to go somewhere and they ran into a problem because they were running out of space and they all couldn't continue to develop. So ridges have to stop development and you see a number of ridge endings. When you see those triangles, there's a, an abnormally large representation of ridge endings in those locations. So seven ridge endings in one of those triangles is not something that instills you with confidence. Seven ridge endings toward the tip of the finger is, that are in agreement as far as their location to one another, where they are in their relative position to one another is extremely important. And seven in that area is exceptionally reliable. So at that point, you can make an identification. And as a practical matter, my own personal standard has never been to drop below seven. And I don't know of examiners who have. Thank you. I appreciate that explanation. I don't have any other questions for this witness. Hmm? And welcome back, everybody, to the Law and Crime Network. I'm your host this afternoon, Rachel Stockman. We are just replaying some testimony from this morning from a DNA analyst in the Larry Whaley case. I know not the most interesting testimony, but always testimony that's very, very important to the trials that we cover here on the Law and Crime Network. If you're just joining us, this is a case that we've been following out of Iowa involving a man who's accused of killing 19-year-old Samantha Teeter. Uh, it was a late night thing in the December of 2016 where uh, they were sleeping apparently and he shot and killed her, shooting her in the head through a door. I'm joined alongside Beth Karras, legal analyst, former prosecutor. Um, so, you know, as you're able to catch up a little bit more on some of the testimony, specifically from the boyfriend of Samantha Teeter, it seems that you're getting a little more convinced that this guy is guilty. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. Uh, Whaley had given her a key, given Teeter a key to his apartment. They, she and her boyfriend, did not have a key to the apartment building, but they did to the second floor apartment itself. Right. So they need to get into the building, need to get buzzed in, and they actually like whistled and tried to get Whaley's attention to say, hey, we're downstairs, you know, you need to buzz us in. They get in the building, and then they go up and start to open the door, and he was a little apprehensive, the boyfriend, about going up there and having to like go, go into his right, apartment. Right, because they knew he had a they gun. They knew he had a gun. So, I mean, there had been some contact earlier in the day, and... The idea that Samantha Teeter's boyfriend was apprehensive to me sounds like, okay, he knows this guy's got a gun, but lots of people have guns and they're law-abiding citizens with their guns. They don't just shoot through doors. But something about Larry Whaley made Teeter's boyfriend think, yeah, you gotta be really careful. You know, maybe he thought this guy's gonna be a little too loose with his finger on the trigger, which is indeed what happened. I, I still... So there's something about this I just really don't understand. So Samantha Teeter is 19 years old. Uh, we've been showing pictures of her, her here on the Long Crime Network. She had a young baby, young family. This Larry Whaley guy is 60 years old. I don't know the okay. connection. Yeah, so this is the, this, and, and I've been looking through everything, and we missed, I will say here on the network, unfortunately, we missed some of the openings and some of the testimony, and maybe these questions were answered, so if any of our chatters know, or anyone that's watching this know, I, part of me needs to understand why this 19-year-old girl, and I get the bike thing, that they knew each other, and he, and she had to retrieve her bike, for, or something like that. But at 3.30 like, in the morning? Like, why was a 19-year-old with her boyfriend going into a 60-year-old's 
apartment. I don't get it. I mean, I don't know. Is there something to do with drugs? Something going that's on? What I don't I'm want thinking. to dirty up no, any no, characters I don't, I don't unnecessarily, want, right, either, but I'm but just that's speculating. What I'm thinking yeah. right off the top of my head yeah. that maybe this is a drug thing. We know this other lady, Deb. Um, Ewing, who Hewing, was sleeping on one of Whaley's couches. And she was high on meth at the time. So, you know, it's a possibility. Um, I don't know. We haven't heard any testimony to that effect, but I am going to continue my quest to find out <laughs> how these people knew each other. Because shot, I think it's key. He shot through a closed door. So I just got case a problem with that. I got a problem he's, with that. Case closed for Beth. He's, okay, he's not, he, we can stop know, he, here. He's the kind of guy who makes it hard for people to support gun ownership only because he's Trigger a happy. loose cannon. Yeah, he's a loose cannon with his gun. I've got lo family members who are very responsible gun owners and people like him make it look bad to own a gun. Well, let's continue our review. Beth's going to stick around hopefully for a little bit longer. Let's continue our re review of some of the testimony from this morning. Um, specifically, we are going to hear from Victor Murillo, who is the crime lab analyst. More from his testimony inside of the barrel. That's exactly what we want to see. So I can recover those fired bullets. They can be marked appropriately to show that they are test fires. And then eventually I will look at those test fired bullets, the test fired cartridge cases, compare them to one another, and then use those test fires to compare to the unknown bullets and cartridge cases that have been recovered from a crime scene, a house, a wall, a car, or a victim. And I do that microscopically, looking for some unique markings. First, State's Exhibit 4, can you tell the jury what type of gun is this? Well, this is a Ruger, uh, basically we call it a Black Hawk, but it's a new model Super Black Hawk revolver. Uh, it is a six-shot revolver, uh, so we can fire six shots from this particular gun before we have to reload it if we wanted to. So there are six chambers in the cylinder, which is in the middle of the frame. It is a single action revolver. By single action, it means that when I pull the trigger on this gun, it performs one action. It just releases the hammer, which means the shooter, in this case, has to cock the hammer first and then pull the trigger. So it's kind of like an old, if you watch any old cowboy movies, for instance, you have to cock that hammer first and then pull the trigger. If, if I were to load the gun now and just pull the trigger, nothing would happen. So I have to physically cock the hammer. When I do that, it rotates the cylinder to a new chamber that hopefully has a live round on it. And then I can pull the trigger that drops the hammer and fires the cartridge that's in that chamber that's in line with the barrel. So it works a little differently than some other revolvers that have a double action mode or you can simply pull the trigger. It's kind of a long, heavy trigger pull, and it cocks the hammer and releases the hammer when you pull that trigger. In this case, you have to physically cock the hammer. When we pull the trigger, it only releases that hammer, and so it's a little lighter trigger pull, um, but it requires two actions by the shooter. And Mr. Murillo, were you asked to bring uh, some dummy round with you? I did. Uh, what, are, what is a dummy round? Well, a dummy round is something that we use in the laboratory quite a bit to basically check the functionality of a firearm. Uh, so it looks like a real live round of ammunition, uh, but there's no primer, there's no powder in that cartridge. Um, so we can uh, load it into a magazine and check the functionality of the gun, make sure it's working correctly. And so we use them quite a bit uh, in the lab to make sure those guns are functioning properly. And would using some dummy rounds be helpful in explaining to the jury how this 44 <coughs> revolver operates or functions? Yes, it could. Your Honor, with the court's permission, uh, I would ask that Ms. Morello be able to remove the cable lock and use a couple of those dummy rounds to show how this revolver would be loaded and how it functions. Okay. Any objection, defense? No, Your Honor. All right. That's fine. May I approach? I have the key. Very well. While he's removing the uh, cable lock, Your Honor, it might be easier for the jurors to see if Mr. Morello is allowed to come down, if that's okay. That's fine. 
Mr. Morello, if you want to step stand down. down here, it might be okay. easier. Just keep your voice up so the reporter is able to hear you, please. Sure. <coughs> Forty-four Magnum dummy cartridges. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, at the base of those cartridges is usually going to be a primer, kind of a shiny piece of metal. See in the bottom of those dummy cartridges, there's kind of a hole in there, so there's no primer. They've always been powdered and just uh, and having loud noises so that it won't pull the trigger on them. Either. And again, just to check the functionality of that primer. So basically, what I'm going to do is try to show you a little bit about how the gun functions how it's loaded, how it works. Again, this is a double action revolver. Uh, the way the gun works, again, is, as I mentioned earlier, if I just pull the trigger on this firearm, it will not fire. You have to physically cock the hammer and pull this hammer to the rear. And you can watch that cylinder rotate as I do that. It's gonna rotate in a clockwise fashion to the next chamber. So the chamber that would have been in about that 11 o'clock position I cocked the hammer, it rotated to the 12 o'clock position relative to the shooter. And now the hammer is lined up with that chamber within that 12 o'clock position. So once I cock the hammer, I can pull the trigger. If I do that, that releases the hammer, which will fire that cartridge that's in line with the barrel. So in order to load this particular firearm, usually the way that we're going to load it is to open up what we call a loading gate on the right-hand side of the frame of that revolver. Once we've opened up that loading gate, it exposes the back end of the chambers on the back side of that cylinder. Once we've exposed the chamber, we can take one of the cartridges, a live round, this is just a dummy round, and we can load that cartridge into the back end of the cylinder, and then we can rotate the cylinder to the next chamber. The next one that's empty, we can load another cartridge, and we continue to do that until we've loaded up all six cartridges in the six chambers that are in that cylinder. Once everything is loaded, all the cartridges are loaded correctly, we can close up that loading gate, and now we can go ahead and fire that revolver. Just as I mentioned before, cock the hammer, <coughs> pull the trigger, and that fires the round that would have been at that 11 o'clock position. It's going to continue to rotate in that clockwise fashion until we get to the cartridges that are loaded. So in this case, I can kind of see on your left-hand side here where those cartridges are on the back of the cylinder. So if I wanted to, I could pull the hammer back just a little bit, rotate those cartridges. I know that that cartridge now is in the 11 o'clock position and also in the 8 o'clock position. So now it's ready to be fired if I wanted just to fire those two cartridges that I loaded. So at this point, when I cock the hammer, the one that's in that 11 o'clock position is going to rotate to 12, fire it. Rotate the next one, and fire it. Once we've loaded and fired all of the cartridges that are in that cylinder, we have to remove the fired cartridge cases. So when we fire the gun, the hammer's going to drop hammer is going to hit a firing pin on the inside of the frame. The firing pin is going to go forward and it's going to hit the primer. That's where that hole was on the back side of that cartridge. That primer is going to cause a little spark on the inside of that cartridge. That spark is going to ignite or cause the powder to burn on the inside of that cartridge. Once that powder burns, it creates a lot of pressure. That pressure is going to push the bullet that we had on the front end of that cartridge down the barrel and towards the target that we're shooting at. That pressure is also going to be what we feel, the recoil that we're going to feel when we fire the gun. Every time you fire it, pull the trigger, the hammer drops, the bullet goes down the barrel, and the gun's going to kick. That's all of that pressure that builds up inside of that chamber. It's going to push that cartridge case to the rear, back side of the chamber, and it's going to kick or we're going to feel that recoil from the firearm. So once we've done that, we've loaded all the cartridges and fired all of those cartridges, we now need to remove the fired cartridge case. Cartridge
which cases the cup that's used to hold the powder and the bullets, which would be the brass part of that dummy round that we were looking at earlier. With the removed fired cartridge cases, all we do is open up that loading gate again. We can expose the fired cartridge case. On the bottom of the barrel, there's a small handle there with a little rod that can be used to eject those fired cartridge cases out so that we can grab them. I'm, done, I'm pulling out a dummy round, but it would just be the fired cartridge case the brass part that we can see on the back side of this cartridge, right? Once we've done that, we can rotate to the next fired cartridge case, line it up, push the little rod on the underside, push that cartridge case out, and now we have as many fired cartridge cases as we fired in that particular revolver. So we're going to dump all those cartridge cases out, and then we can reload the cylinder if we wanted to. We can reload each of those chambers with a new live round, close up the gate if we wanted to, and then continue to fire after that. Thank you, Mr. Morello. You may take a seat. I have a few questions before you put the <coughs> cable lock back on, though, please. And welcome back, everybody, to the Law and Crime Network. I'm your host this afternoon, Rachel Stockman, and you are joining the live Gavel to Gavel Trial Network. So, of course, we have a live trial that we are bringing you right here on the network, and that is the Larry Whaley Second Degree Murder Trial. It's a trial that we're following out of Mason City, Iowa. The uh, jurors are on about an hour lunch. They went to lunch about 45 minutes ago, so we expect they'll be back in about a half an hour or so. Um, this is a case of a man accused of second de degree murder for killing a young woman, 19 years old, Samantha Teeter, who was uh, trying to enter his house. The two knew each other. Uh, and he, I guess, claims he thought that she was coming in there for, for bad purposes and that he, he shot her through the door and ended up killing her. One of the shots uh, shooting her, in her on her head. Um, she was alongside her boyfriend at the time, and he testified in this trial as well. There's a picture of her. She's a mom. She has a two-year-old little boy. Um, I'm alongside Beth Karras, who's a legal analyst and a former prosecutor, and this case does really bring up some interesting issues about self-defense because you're not buying based on what we know, uh, and we do understand the prosecution's case is coming to a close, but you're not buying that this was a self-defense case. I'm not, and I really should keep my uh, an open mind until all the evidence is in because that's what jurors are, are um, supposed to do, and I should do be a 13th juror, as we all should, I suppose. But um, I, I just, there's no other defense. What other defense did they have to go with, right? I mean... He fired through the door and shot he was her. There. I mean, Everyone it's knows a, who shot yeah, him. Yeah, exactly. There's no issue about who did it and what happened. Uh, it's not a who done it. So, I I just I can't I just can't get over the fact that he the threat is in his head of what these people may do to him if these were the stalkers or whoever he thought was coming after him. I would want to know the history of you know and like ha have these people he feared beat him up in the past? Have they uttered threats to kill him? Have they brandished guns? Have they fired at the ceiling or over his head in the past so that he felt he needed to use fatal force against whoever was outside his door? I mean, Teeter and her boyfriend had alerted them that, or alerted him that they were coming up. He gave Teeter his key. I mean, it just, I, I just, I can't get over that, and I just don't know how the defense is going to. But you need all 12 jurors to agree, so maybe there will be one or two jurors who will say, you know what? And it did maybe seem there is an from the testimony from the boyfriend yesterday that, uh, that there was a fear from the boyfriend and Samantha Teeter of what Larry Whaley could yes, do. They were that, scared of him. Yes, the yes. fact that they whistled and they sh uh, he used a flashlight to kind of and wake he, him up. He was reticent um, to have to... You know, go go inside the apartment because he knew Larry Whaley had a gun. So I I find um, it's well, a big hurdle like, for the defense. This is a civil thing, but I mean, you know, assumption of risk. There, you're entering someone's home at 3:30 in the morning. You know they're armed. Um, you know, 
obviously that there are some concer concerns. Um, eh, not the smartest thing so for these folks to do. So why do it? If you're so that concerned, so it? why do it? Why yeah. not just wait till uh, daylight and he can look out the window and see you clearly and know, you know, who's there? Good question. You st she still shouldn't have been killed, even if she didn't, she didn't assume the risk and, and thus, you know, well, of course. contribute I mean, to listen, her death. This is someone's by doing life, this right. absolutely. This isn't a civil case, this is a criminal case. Um, and you can't fault someone for making a bad decision. Um, you know, things happen. Um, no one deserves to be to die. We don't know. Of it. I, I mean, I don't know enough about her background, and um, but there's a lovely profile of her online uh, that we've looked at, and it, it does say in recent years she'd been struggling. So I don't know what that means, um, but it, life couldn't have been all that easy for her. She was 19, and she had a two-year-old. So you know, I'm sure she was a very loving mother, but it's got to be difficult, you know, when you're still growing up yourself to be raising a child. To be a teen mom, absolutely. Um, well, that's going to hopefully stick around a little bit longer. We're going to continue our review of the testimony uh, from this morning in the Larry Whaley case. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, an evidence technician uh, that was th involved in the investigation on that day. I want to make sure record, if we're looking at States Exhibit 3, this is a door to apartment number 2, Mr. Whaley's apartment. Yes. And there's a state's exhibit number three in the top right hand corner. Yes. The side of the door that has the state's exhibit sticker on, is that the inside of the door inside the apartment or the outside? This would be the inside of the apartment. So if we're looking at the sticker state's exhibit three with the door handle on the left, we'd be inside the apartment going to the hallway. Correct. The opposite side's obviously in the hallway looking in. Right. And there is some, looks like a substance by the locks if uh, people are handling this door, should they wear gloves? Yes. Is that just for safety precaution? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Orr, did you and other law enforcement officers collect bullet fragments from the hallway as well as inside apartment number two? Yes. And then eventually were they collected and taken back to the laboratory? Yes. I'm sorry, to the police department? Correct. May I approach? Yes. Ms. Orr, I've handed you what's been marked as State's Exhibit Number 7. Are these the bullet fragments that are, are bullets that were collected from Mr. Whaley's apartment in the hallway? Yes. The state would offer into evidence State's Exhibit Number 7. No objection. Exhibit 7 will be admitted. May I approach again? Yes. Ms. Orr, did you take, did law enforcement officer take pictures of the hallway as well when you were processing the scene? Yes. And I've handed you some photographs. Are these just some of the photographs that would have been taken of that area? Yes. State would offer into evidence state's exhibits 21 through 24 and 26. Any objection, Ms. Eimann? No, Your Honor. Okay. Exhibits 21, 22, 23, 24, and 26 are admitted. Permission to publish? You may. We'll start with State's Exhibit number 21. Ms. Orr, what does this show? Items on the floor in the hallway. On the floor in the hallway. Is this in the landing by Mr. Whaley's door? Yes. 
It's in State's Exhibit Number 22. Can you tell us what that is? 22, that's a biological on a, on a part of the floor outside. State's Exhibit 23. Also appears to be a, a biological with possibly a bone if on the carpet. We're looking at the bottom left-hand corner of the picture. At the bottom left um, could also be tissues. Okay. State's Exhibit 24. Same thing, some biologicals on the floor. And this is outside in the hallway and this on We're the still, in the, still in the hallway, yes. State's Exhibit 26. What is, what state's exhibit 26? 26 is a card or a piece of paper that was um, found in the security door. Going back for a second to state's exhibit 24, we see cones here. Are the cones removed to take a photograph that was underneath it? Yes, that's correct. And is, what's your understanding why the cones were placed there? The cones were placed to secure the evidence. Um, this is an apartment building, so it could have been a, the stairways could have been a common area, just basically to preserve the items. And did you also do a swab with some type of cotton Q-tip or some type of instrument to get any bi biologicals from the top of a step? Yes. And how do you do that? With sterile swabs. And then when you do the sterile swab, do you? put them all in the same box? No, each swab would get its own individual swab box. Did you also do a swab of tissue or blood or hair from the wall above the apartment door? Yes. And were those sent to the DCI laboratory for testing? Customarily, yes, we do. Those particular ones, I'd have to look at the reports, but. Okay. I want to show you three additional photographs. May I approach, Your Honor? Yes. or states exhibits 56, 57, and 58. Are these uh, clothing from Samantha Teeter? Yes. The state would offer into evidence the photographs of those clothing, states exhibits 56, 57, and 58. Any objection? No, Your Honor, right. thank you. Exhibits 56, 57, and 58 are admitted. Starting with State's Exhibit 56. Ms. Orr, can you tell us what this shows? That is a sports bra and a glove. Is it your understanding Ms. Teeter's clothing was eventually collected from the hospital and brought to the Mason City Police Department? Yes. State's Exhibit 57. Can you tell us what that is? 57, a uh, winter coat, believed to be worn by Samantha and a key. Did you find a key? The key was in the pocket, yes. <coughs> the pocket of this coat? Yes. And if you look at the key, I know we can't do a close-up, is there a number on it? It is stamped with a number two. Then States Exhibit 58. What is this? 58 is a close-up of that key and it would be the other side of the key from the previous picture. Same key we saw on the coat, now it's just flipped over. Yes. Did you try this key in the locks to State's Exhibit Number 3 to Mr. Whaley's apartment door? Yes. So if we went on the opposite side of the state sticker and when you stuck the key in the, the bottom lock, did it work? Yes, it does. Does the key work for the, did it work for the deadbolt as well? Yes, it did. So that one key opens both locks to State's Exhibit 3? Correct. Did you also 
collect uh, Samantha Teeter's stocking hat and headband? Yes, we did. May I approach your honor? You may. Have you had an opportunity to look at those photos? Yes. Okay, and are those photos taken of that room 128? Yes. And inside of it? Yes. At this time, I would offer state's exhibits 59 through 64. Any objection? No, Your Honor. All right. State's exhibits 59 through 64 are admitted. I'll start with... Uh, 59 if I could publish your honor you may Describe what that photo is taken of so that's a picture of the door from the outside the hallway looking towards the door Room just documenting the room number We'll move to photo 60 And would you describe what we're observing here? Sure, on the, um, it's kind of a smaller table in the corner of the hotel room. Um, we found this printout, um, just a hotel registration, what it appeared to be, um, and it has Mr. Whaley's name on it. So that would help identify him as the person who purchased this room? Yes. We'll move to 61. Would you please describe what we're observing? That's just an overall picture of the room um, before we begin to search it. We'll look at 62. Is this also just items that you put on the bed just as an overview uh, of the room at 128? Yes, that's a picture of some of the items we found on the bed and then um, some of the let, excuse me let me just ask you this so they were just placed on the bed then and then you took a picture of that correct we'll move on to the next photo which would be 63 can you describe what that would be it's a new cell phone or appear to be a new cell phone case or the packaging as if you would just buy a cell phone and that'd be the packaging that came in and again, is that one of the items that you ended up collecting in this matter? Or did you just take a photograph? I think we just it? took a photo of that. I don't believe we took the actual case. I'd have to double check. We'll move on to exhibit 64. And what would that be a picture of? Um, that's a picture of a receipt that I found that was lying on the bed. And what's the, do you know the significance of why you would have kept that receipt then? Um, what stood out to me was that uh, there was a purchase uh, it's listed there of ammunition um, from the store and, and then also the date um, that was with uh, the night before I believe um, so just from what I the information I've been provided of kind of what the overall of the investigation that was significant so and that's the receipt just to the right there uh, what would that be uh, that's a cell phone also that we found near or lying on top of the bed and that looks like a cell phone that has a case on top of it that looks broken or busted up. Is that correct? Yes. Just to ask you one other question of the receipt, if you would look at the photograph there. Sure. What time uh, is on that receipt when those items were purchased? Uh, the, it gives a military time and it looks like a date of 12 1 16 and then also of time of 1937 and in our time or non-military time what would that be that would be 7 37 p.m. and that would be the time that this item would have been purchased yes it also has some type of a site on there uh, was that actually purchased or was that deleted out yeah that was also interesting um, there's a laser sight, but then it, above it says avoided entry, so, and then the minus of the cost of it, so assuming that they did not buy that. So there was, on that receipt, there was a phone that was purchased and also 
ammunition, is that correct? Yes. Or just am, just ammunition on, on that uh, Walmart receipt? Yes, the phone was underneath the receipt. Now, the pertinent evidence uh, in this case, did you then take that uh, to the Mason City Police Department? Yes, I did. And they would have logged it in and, and uh, kept that as evidence at the Mason City Police Department? Actually, I logged it in and then put it in storage. The other items uh, that we saw on the bed and so forth, uh, did you give those back to Deb then, Deb Ewing? Yes, we, uh, hotel staff asked us what they wanted us to do with it and we collected it all up and brought it to the police department and <coughs> met with her later and gave it to her. I don't have anything further. Thank you, sir. Cross-examination. Thank you. Good morning, officer. Good morning. May I direct your attention to State's Exhibit 60 for just a moment? Sure. That's the days in receipt, is that right? Uh, yes. If you look at that, do you see a date and time indicated on that? Uh, yes, I do. What is the date and time that you see? I see it, I'm sorry, I just see a date. Um, I do see a time, I'm sorry. That's okay. Can you tell us the date and time that you see? Uh, there's a printed date of 12-1-2016 and then a time of 9.42 p.m. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. Redirect. Nothing further, Your Honor. May this witness. And welcome back, everybody, to the Law and Crime Network. We are once again in standby mode. We are going to bring you live gavel to gavel coverage when the lunch break is over in the Larry Whaley case, a case that we've been following out of Iowa. A man charged with second degree murder for shooting a woman, 19 year old Samantha Teeter, through a door late night, about 3 34 o'clock in the morning, one night in December of 2016. There she is, right there, the victim with her two year old son. Very tragic story. He's claiming self-defense. It's very likely, almost certain, in fact, that he's going to take the stand in his own defense. There he is, his mugshot. He's 60 years old. What does he have to do to convince the jurors that this was a self-defense case? Because there's so many questions here that really this was him being reckless. He has to bring the jury to that very moment, that night, early morning. He has to put them in his shoes. He has to make them feel the fear that he was feeling so that they will say, you know what? He was justified in shooting through that door. It was reasonable for him to use this deadly force against a person he didn't see on the other side of the door. Okay, I got a question about this, um, this reasonableness standard. So if we're thinking about this guy, Larry Whaley, um, it sounds to me from some of the letters he wrote to the judge, he's kind of a paranoid <clears throat> guy, I don't know, maybe he does have some mental health issues. I don't know, that really hasn't come up yet. But is when we talk the reasonable standard for self-defense, is it an average person in his shoes or an average person like Larry Whaley? Do you, you know, see what I'm getting to here? It varies state to state, and I need to look at, that's a good question. It, will, it varies state to state. Sometimes yeah. it's a reasonable person, just the average, just a reasonable person. And sometimes it's what a reasonable person under those circumstances, circumstances, which I think is how the defense opened on it. So yes. I think it is the latter. Uh, so it's got to be whatever he was facing and his knowledge of threats against him, prior threats or whatever against him, and whether or not it was reasonable to actually fire the gun. You, you think it's going to be a tough hurdle for him I to I still get think through. it's going to be a tough hurdle, yes. Uh, right. But he may have some psychiatric issues that will play a factor. We also don't know if drugs played into this. We do know another woman who was there that day, Deb, Deb Ewing, um, who testified yesterday. She was there that day. She was in the room. Apparently, she was sleeping on the couch and testified to the fact that uh, Larry Whaley very quickly just opened fire uh, a, a shooting through the door and killing Samantha Teeter. Um, but she testified that she had been high on drugs at the time as well. So, of course, 
when you have that kind of testimony, the question always is how much she's sleeping, she's foggy, she's high on drugs. How much does she really remember of this perceived threat that Larry says he claims he right. heard? Was her, and was her perception impaired by, by the use of drugs, her sleepy state, was she semi-conscious, I mean, whatever. Uh, judgment uh, is impaired often when under the influence of whatever it is, alcohol, whatever the substance. Uh, so, you know, that's definitely a factor in assessing her credibility. Um, so it looks like, if we can, show the courtroom. Um, we have our feed. Testimony has not begun in the courtroom, but it looks like Larry Whaley is there uh, speaking with his attorney, and I'm guessing that testimony is going to begin very shortly in this case. Again, they were taking a lunch break. Um, we were hearing this morning's testimony was a bit dry in this case because we were hearing from DNA analysts, crime scene technicians, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is all testimony, by the way, that's, that's important and the state needs to put on because they've got to be held to their proof sure. uh, to prove every element of the crime charge beyond a reasonable doubt. But the real battle begins with the self-defense. And, and uh, I, I know that the state already knows what the defense is and maybe countering it, but it's just, I mean, the facts aren't in dispute. It's what's going on inside Larry Whaley's head and what do we call his conduct? Well, that's, that's why I always issue. wonder for these kind of cases, um, especially when it's really not a question of who pulled the trigger, when uh, prosecutors spend so much time going over some of the forensics, like what, uh, like you said, they have to do it to establish their case. But in terms of value of proving what happened, it's really not that valuable to no, them. No, but in the other uh, shooting through the door case, Oscar Pistorius, that I talked about a little while ago, um, all the forensic was really important because he said that he had his, his legs on, he wasn't standing on his, his stumps, and there, so the height of the bullets and the angle and how many times he fired, it's all you know, important to determine uh, whether or not he was telling the truth and the reasonableness of it. But the law requires, and Iowa follows this, that you have to use the minimal force. You have to meet whatever force is, uh, you're facing with the minimal amount. You know, you can use deadly force if you are reasonable in fearing that you may be killed, you can kill. But the idea that, you know, I know he's in his apartment, he doesn't have to like run into another but room you necessarily. But you do have special protections. Um, and generally speaking, the law gives you more allowances when you're in your home yes. at the time of something like this. But Samantha Teeter was, put the key in the door and she's starting to open the door. Larry Whaley is not the only person who had a key to his apartment. I mean, he gave it to her. They warned him that they were coming upstairs. Did he actually hear the warning? I don't know. I don't know if, if um, he will testify, if he even testifies, that he heard them say, hey, you know, you got to let us up. you got to let us in. We're coming up. Uh, if he didn't know they were coming, maybe it's 3.30, it's before 4 o'clock in the morning. Maybe he's scared because somebody's opening the door. But Samantha Teeter had a key. He gave her a key. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you have kids and your kids are coming in late at night, but you also have somebody you're fearful, you know, is stalking you, are you just going to shoot through the door? Because one of your, you know, it could be one of your kids coming in. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. This is a young woman who he, he knew had a key. All right. So it is about 148 Eastern time, 1248 in Iowa, where this trial is going on. And we're expected testimony to begin probably maybe in about 10 minutes. Um, I can tell you that the defendant, Larry Whaley, has returned back into the courtroom. Um, and it looks like we're probably going to hear from um, more investigators who are involved in all of this. When we left for break, and it was a little bit unclear, but I'm really hoping that we are able to hear from Deb Ewing, um, who, again, we talked about her earlier. She was the, the woman who was sleeping in his apartment. The guy who was on the stand before was one of the investigators before we broke for lunch, and he is testifying to the fact he interviewed Deb. So I don't know if there is like an interview tape that they're planning to play, but I had a feeling from the way the questioning was going before we went to lunch, that's where they were going and with I, all I of this. I suspect that because the prosecution called Ewing that uh, this investigator is it's probably going to 
corroborate and maybe bolster her in-court testimony by um, saying that she said consistent statements. If they try to impeach her credibility by uh, challenging her ability to recall and her, her perception and her influence of uh, substances, maybe this detective will say that these are prior consistent statements she meant she said and and she's been consistent all along well that's what I'm e exactly wondering where they're going with this I would assume that they are going to be consistent statements but we'll see right. um, again <laughs> as she testified to in court um, uh, she was high at the time on meth so there are some questions about her account of what happened um, you know, this story is just one of these kind of tragic stories because clearly um, I don't think this guy had any intention of maybe killing Samantha Teeter, per se. I mean, I don't no. think he had the premeditated... No, absolutely, absolutely not. But you can intend to kill someone else and kill a third person by mistake, and it's still an intentional killing. It's a, it's a transferred intent. You know, if it's first degree, I mean, if it's second degree murder, it is an intentional killing. It's just not a premeditated killing because in, he's shooting through the door to stop whatever threat he perceived, right? So, and he shoots her in the head. So he, he did intend to shoot. Um, and, and if you're just joining us, you're looking at a live shot right now of the courtroom in Mason City, Iowa, where you can see the defendant there and uh, sitting next to his attorneys, it looks like. Um, and uh, he's waiting for trial to begin. I I'm expecting that we'll probably um, hear more from this trial in the next couple of minutes. The judge indicated the lunch would be about an hour, and that was about an hour ago. Um, at this point, uh, Beth, we've heard from many of the forensic analysts. Um, now we're getting to some of the investigators involved. We heard from the boyfriend, Samantha Teeter's boyfriend. We heard from Deb. I mean, really, it, from the sound of it, this is going to wrap up pretty quickly. Yeah, you need a medical examiner to determine the cause and manner of death, to, to opine to the cause and manner of death. But, I mean, there's not, it's, it's not, there's not a lot more to put on, actually. And then I would imagine the defense is going to put on a case. I would imagine Whaley's going to testify, but we'll see. I, I, I almost think he really has to, given what he's saying occurred. So he's going to have to bring, like we were saying earlier, Beth, he's going to have to bring the jurors into his mindset, into the knowledge of what had occurred that day. Um, one of the things that Deb Ewing talked about when she took the stand was her fear of this stalker person. I guess it was her ex-lover, um, ex-boyfriend. Um, that she was fearful of and that she'd actually booked a hotel room at a local motel because she was scared he would come after her. But went to Whaley's instead. Right, so, right. So, I mean, he'd have to, that, that's another self-defense. I mean, he's got his own people he feared. And then you can, you can defend a third person, right? You can successfully do, self-defense is just defense of yourself or a third person. So he could pull that. We haven't heard him say that yet. Right. But he has to see the threat. It's, that's not as good an argument as what's going on in his head by people he says are stalking him. Well, interestingly, um, she had had this prior relationship with someone named Jason Bendixson. And he was a local guy who had actually uh, been previously convicted of burglary before. Um, and she thought he was stalking her around the time that she had met Whaley. Um, oh, and, 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 and it looks like Whaley had been the one, actually, I'm just reviewing notes here, that had rented a room at the Days Inn for her and himself, and he said he didn't want to return to the apartment. So, um... He also said he didn't want to sh kill someone that night. He was already... So, like, this guy was pretty in his paranoid. Head. Yeah. Um, that something was going to happen. He had booked a hotel room, said he didn't want to kill someone tonight. My question is, why didn't they go to the hotel room if they were so scared? That's weird. Um, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Maybe he'll answer it. But the idea that he said, I don't want to kill someone tonight also is a trigger to me that, you know, this guy is just, you know, maybe he shouldn't have a gun. Right. 
Well, yeah, and we don't know. It doesn't seem in, in terms of his history whether he, it doesn't sound like from what I've read and what I know about this case that he was in illegally in possession of the gun. From what I understand, he had the right to have the gun. Um, so, you know, it's going to be interesting to hear his side of things. Um, from the outset, it looks like a case where he, so uh, no pun intended, jumped the gun in terms of uh, going shooting. Uh, right. but so, and that's at least a manslaughter, maybe higher. Now, it's not, it's supposed to be a short case though, right? Like today's, uh, yeah, well, the, today's the Wednesday? The prosecution said that they're probably going to wrap to about, uh, about this afternoon. So then we'll probably hear from a couple of witnesses from the defense tomorrow. And then I would expect closings either maybe Thursday afternoon or Friday. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this isn't one of these cases. We've had cases that have gone on weeks and weeks and weeks because the bottom line here is there's not that much to this case. It's either you believe this was a self-defense case. It's not a whodunit. You either believe it's a self-defense case or you don't. You know, I didn't try a lot of cases around Christmas time, but I handled a lot of cases in court uh, around the holidays in terms of, you know, pleas and arraignments and stuff like that. And there was always this benevolence at the holiday time. You know, judges were a little more lenient and prosecutors were a little more lenient with plea offers. And I yeah, don't know. Yeah, because no one wants to work around the holidays. No, but they're feeling like it's holidays, you know, people oh, are in a good okay. mood. It's yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. we'll let you take time served. So I'm just saying, you know, this this case is going to go to the jury right before right oh, there, before Christmas. I, I wonder mean, what that jury's going to do. Friday, if it goes Friday afternoon, which it seems like all of our cases end up going into verdict watch Friday afternoon, I can guarantee you, with it being Christmas weekend and people having their plans and family and relatives coming over, that this is probably going to be a very short deliberation. And are they going to be nice to him? Are they going to give him, uh, if they convict him, give him a, a, a lesser included right. or something? I don't know. If they're going to feel a little benevolent. Well, let's remember Miss Teeter and that little boy of hers. That's what I right. say. Right, no, you're right. I mean, someone was killed here. Uh, a mother was it's killed, awful. a 19-year-old that was killed that for no reason. For no reason uh, didn't deserve to die from uh, what we understand of the situation, did nothing um, other than uh, to return to this apartment which she had a key for to deserve being killed. Uh, so it is a tragic situation. The question that the jurors are going to have to answer is whether or not he meets the threshold under the law um, to qualify as a self-defense case. And we will have to wait and see. Um, if we can just take you all back into the courtroom and just show a shot from the courtroom so you can get a sense of what's going on. Again, it looks like we have Larry Whaley sitting at the defendant's table. Um, we've seen people kind of milling in and out as we wait for our testimony to begin. Um, earlier, before we went to break, we had investigator Terrence Prochaska, and apologies if I'm mispronouncing his name. He was on the stand. I believe he's going to take the stand uh, again uh, as a prosecution witness. And uh, Beth, he was, t he was the one that was talking about the interview with Deb Ewing. Right. That's right. So he was setting up the uh, circumstances of that and uh, talking about collecting as much information as possible so he can go in. You know, when you do an interrogation, uh, interviewing witnesses or a suspect, you need to be armed with uh, as much information as possible so you can tell when they're not telling you the truth or if you need more clarification. But obviously, in the very beginning of an investigation, you just start collecting as, many, as much facts as possible. But then, once you've collected the facts, you go in and you do these in-depth um, interviews because this is, I mean, she, she's a key witness, obviously. Uh, she was there. She's an eye and ear witness to the shooting. And um, I don't know either if the police investigators also interviewed him at the time uh, that night and what he mm. said, what he said to them. Because What's he saying immediately after? <clears throat> he I made some comments immediately after that he didn't I can't remember what the comments were, but he was making some comments. I don't know if it was an interrogation. Uh, and, of course, those comments will also be key to all of this mm -hmm. in terms of whether or not um, a self-defense justification will fly with the jurors. Again, if you're just joining us on the Law & Crime Network, um, we are on standby mode. It's about 2 o'clock. 
uh, East Coast time, 1 o'clock in Iowa, Mason City. And it looks like things are going to start any minute in the Larry Whaley case, a case that we're following. Beth, my, my guest extraordinaire, we love having her here on the network. She's a legal analyst um, and a former prosecutor, longtime legal analyst for many different networks, kind of giving us her insight. She's pretty convinced this second, uh, excuse me, this self-defense defense is not going to fly in the eyes of the jurors. It looks like that in the next few minutes we'll have uh, testimony start again. So I was going to go back and play some of our testimony from earlier this morning, but I don't want to do that because then I'll have to break out of it to take you live into the courtroom. But again, uh, we're, we're expecting Beth for testimony to wrap up um, this afternoon. And besides having him on the stand, uh, what else do you expect to see from the defense? Uh, from the defense? I don't know if they would, um, I mean, I suppose they could recall Ewing if they wanted to get something more out of her, but they probably did enough on, um, you know, when she was on the stand yesterday. Um, and I, I don't know if there are any character witnesses. And that Beth, they you may know have. what? Sorry to interrupt you. I think we are starting back in the courtroom. It looks like the judge came in and they're bringing the jurors in. So let's take a listen to what's happening in Iowa in the Larry Whaley case. 